Excellent. I'm Alan Altshuler, professor here at the Kennedy School and director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government. On behalf of Harvard University, the Kennedy School, the Institute of Politics, and the Taubman Center, welcome. For all students of public policy and politics, there's a special awe and respect for the office of mayor of New York City. The scale of the city, its history, its diversity, and its challenges routinely seem colossal. Seven and a half million people, scores of racial, ethnic, and language groups, more than a thousand public schools, a municipal budget of $32.7 billion this year. No wonder that the office of mayor has often attracted colossal personalities as well, from Fiorello LaGuardia in the 1930s to our speaker this evening, whose energy, imagination, independence, and tenacity have riveted the attention of all serious students of American politics in recent years. Let me note just a few highlights from our speaker's long and distinguished record of public service. He is a native New Yorker, indeed from Flatbush, where I grew up as well, who graduated from Manhattan College and New York University Law School. In 1970, he joined the office of U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. At age 29, he was aimed, named Chief of the Narcotics Unit and subsequently rose to serve as Executive U.S. Attorney. Following several years in private practice, he returned to the Justice Department at the beginning of the Reagan administration as Associate Attorney General. In 1983, he was appointed U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, where he attracted national attention for his many very significant prosecutions of drug dealers, organized crime figures, and Wall Street white-collar criminals. In 1989, he ran for mayor of New York and was very narrowly defeated by David Dinkins. Undaunted, he was elected next time around in 1993. As mayor, he has presided over the most dramatic drop in crime in the city's history, a 27% drop in major crime since 1993. He has closed a budget gap that exceeded $2.3 billion on an annualized basis when he took office. He has maintained good union relations, even while reducing the city's workforce by 17,000 employees. His administration has also let me note an important source of nationally significant management innovations. Both last year and this, it has been singled out for recognition by the Innovations in American Government Awards Competition, which we administer for the Ford Foundation and with the Ford Foundation here at the Kennedy School, and which provides $100,000 awards to each of 10 extraordinary programs this year. Uh, let me note that uh, uh, one of their programs won last year a program of providing attorneys to police uh, precincts to enable them to devise innovative strategies that link the police and uh, legal perspectives. Uh, really quite an innovative program. This year, it's a much larger program, the ComStat program, which is at the heart of the uh, city's crime reduction effort involving a strategy that uh, uses computer tracking techniques to deploy police resources where they can do the most good on the basis of determining where the crime patterns uh, are developing. That one is a finalist this year. The uh, grand prizes will be announced in December, uh, but already we have identified this as one of the most extraordinary programs in the country. Finally, our speaker this evening is, to put it mildly, one of the less predictable major figures in American politics. A lifelong Republican, he astonished most ob observers by endorsing Mario Cuomo in the 1994 New York State gubernatorial race. More recently, he has been highly critical of the congressional Republican position on federal welfare reform, and he has recently staked out a position on immigration policy, his topic this evening, that is out of step with the national Republican leadership, and given who signed the bills, I guess the national Democratic leadership as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most interesting figures in contemporary American politics, the 107th mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. The, um, uh, some of those things are true. Some are exaggerated because we supplied Alan uh, with, the, uh, with the script. However, 
I should tell you that the, uh, just to get this back to what being mayor is really all about, the only thing of concern in my city today is, is it right for a 12-year-old to interfere with, <laughs> with a... And to show you the great deal of political courage I have, I haven't given an answer to that. Uh, it depends on who you root for. If you, uh, I'm, very, I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, uh, I consider myself, um, well, I should tell you this. I concede uh, to the governor of New York that Albany is the capital of, uh, of the state of New York. And I concede to the president of the United States, I have to, that Washington is the capital of the United States. But New York City is the capital of the world. So we, one of the things to understand about New York City is we always think very modestly. <laughs> and uh, in a way, that has something to do with my talk tonight about New York City being the capital of the world. Uh, the reality is that New York City is the most diverse city in the world. It has more people from different parts of the world speaking different languages than any uh, competitor, certainly within the United States, and even throughout the world. There are great world and international cities like L London, Rome, and Paris, and many that you can think of in uh, Asia and Africa and South America. But no city has uh, people speaking over 200 languages, the vast, varied, immensely uh, different groups of people that make up uh, the business and the society of the city of New York. And uh, maybe that gives you a somewhat different view of immigration. Because what I'd like to talk to you tonight is about what I view as the anti-immigrant movement that's going on in America and why I believe that this movement endangers the most important reason for why we're such a great country, uh, the most important human reason that uh, renews us, reforms us, reawakens us, uh, challenges us with a constant flow of new people who are at the grassroots trying to create a better life for themselves and their children. That sometimes becomes a cliche, but it's a reality. Most of the people that come in uh, try, at the level of society where it makes a difference, to make a better life for themselves. Some fail, because not everyone can, but most succeed. And when they succeed in doing that, when you have hundreds of them and thousands of them and millions of them coming into your city, that city is pushed by a force that is greater than any of the theories of government or abstractions, or, uh, and that has been a very vital force in New York and in America. So I think that um, this is the right place to discuss this issue. This school, uh, the Kennedy School, has in its statement of purpose that your mission is not only to prepare leaders for service in government, but to contribute to the solution of important public problems. And I believe the anti-immigration uh, movement is one of our most serious uh, public problems and uh, unfortunately, it's my view that Washington is only making this problem much, much worse. When I say the anti-immigration movement, what I'm talking about is some of the leg legislation passed by Congress and signed by uh, the president. And um, as I think Alan's introduction indicates, I'm not really very much into partisan politics. I don't, I don't know the difference between a, a Republican Congress that passes a welfare reform law that I think uh, has a lot of damaging impacts on my city and a Democratic president who signs it but says he disagrees with it. I can't figure out the difference between those two things because in reality, they have the same impact on the lives of the people of the city of New York. Uh, so uh, much of that is true about this anti-immigration movement. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it comes from the fact that over, um, that over the last couple of years, the sole focus on immigration has been to emphasize the problems that it creates. Uh, not enough jobs, too many people, country too crowded, at least that's the view that many, many people have. And unfortunately, I listen very carefully, and I'll talk a little more about that later, the presidential debate uh, a couple of nights ago, but I didn't hear either one of the candidates, either the president or, um, or Senator Dole, discuss the issue of immigration, even though very significant legislation has been passed that will have long-term impacts on it. And I think that that's unfortunate. America needs an open, it needs a frank discussion about immigration, and it should be uh, decided with a lot more um, emphasis on trying to get beyond the soundbite and the quick emotional uh, response. Because I believe that a threat to immigration is really a threat to the future of the country. And let me take you through a little of the history of it and some of the present problems that, uh, that we face. 
What we're going through right now about immigration is not new. We've been going through a um, cyclical reaction to immigration almost from the time of the beginning of the Republic, certainly since the 1820s and the 1830s. It shows, if you look at history, that we go through periods of being very optimistic about human beings and wanting them because we see them as basically opportunities and the ability to create success. And then we go through periods where we become very frightened and very fearful. And we think that new people are going to mean less opportunities uh, for us. And uh, I can pick out almost any point in American history and show you this debate going on. In 1923, there was an anti-immigrant song that was published in New York. And the name of the song was Close the Gates. And the song went like this. I won't sing it for you. I'll read it. Because <laughs> if I sing it for you, you'll leave. <laughs> Close the gates of our nation. Lock them firm and strong. Before this mob from Europe shall drag our colors down. Unfortunately, um, this kind of fear-mongering uh, works. Just one year later, in 1924, Congress passed new immigration quotas that cut dramatically the number of people coming from Europe because they were coming from Southern Europe. It cut the number of people coming from Italy and Greece dramatically down to only a handful. And as part of it, uh, completely eliminated any immigration from China and Japan. It was banned altogether in 1923. Commenting on that quota law in, in 1924, the New York Times said, America, the melting pot, comes to an end. Well, it really hadn't come to an end. We were going through a phase then, like we're going through now, where we were frightened of people who talked different, looked different, worried that all our opportunities had been taken up and there was no more room here. Uh, during the period of time since then, over 100 million Americans are descended from the immigrants who came in because we relaxed a lot of those uh, problems. And a million more are, de are descended from people who have come in over and over again throughout uh, the years. Uh, I just happened to look because I was coming to Boston. At this time of the year, when I think about coming to Boston, it's usually for baseball. And I always leave happy. <laughs> But, but I noted that between 1830 and 1930, over 700,000 people from Ireland arrived in Boston. And between 1880 and 1930, over 500,000 people from Italy arrived uh, in Boston. A member of my staff who helped me with this speech and does with many, Clark Welton, uh, has very special reason to be grateful to Boston's historic role, much like New York, as a haven for new, new Americans. In 1848, his great-grandparents escaped the potato famine in Ireland. They came to Boston, and uh, they worked hard and really didn't acquire very much money, but they worked very hard for several generations, for two generations. And uh, their son, in 1905, became the mayor of Boston. And that is precisely what happened in my family. Uh, my uh, grandfather, for whom uh, I'm named, he was Rodolfo, and I'm Rudolph. Uh, came from Italy in the 1890s. He had absolutely no money. Uh, I think he had $20 in his pocket, it says on the manifest. And uh, he didn't have a great deal of success. He passed on a lot of things and a lot of feelings about the country. And then uh, his grandson is now the mayor of New York City. And uh, there are thousands and millions of stories like this in the history of this country. It would be a terrible mistake to kind of like cut those stories off and that process off because um, it can happen for anybody if you let it happen. And if you are willing uh, to allow, a, and I mean this in the best sense of the word, a free market in human beings. Just be open to them rather than being afraid of them. Uh, each one of us, if we think about it carefully enough, owes a great deal uh, to immigration. And then there are times in which we relax enough to uh, concentrate on it, and a lot of this anti-immigrant uh, feeling uh, uh, evaporates which is really what we have to give ourselves the time to do. I think we realize that if we were to severely restrict or really significantly change immigration, we may very well deprive ourselves of the single biggest key to success that America has had. I believe we've become the most successful nation because we're more open to reform of, by people, reformation by people, reinvigoration by people than other societies. We haven't closed ourselves as much. Uh, you can feel safer if you close yourself, but you don't give yourself the opportunity to grow when that's the case. 
in my government in New York City, and Alan, you mentioned it before, we put a great deal of emphasis on reinvention, reengineering, and reforming. I probably have other titles for this too. But the theory of it is to kind of straighten out government agencies, to make them work more efficiently, to have them be more responsive to people, to have them do more with less because we spend too much money and we have to find more relevant ways to spend that money. We try to look to see how competition through privatization can help government agencies. The whole Comstat program that you mentioned is really an attempt to take business principles and incorporate it into the police department so that we have the police department guided now by a theory of reducing crime rather than just arresting people, because they were one step away from what they actually should achieve. The police department was run on the basis of rewards and detriments based on the number of arrests that you made. But we hadn't focused on the fact that an arrest is a failure, a necessary failure, but a failure. Now what we do is we measure how much crime is there in the city every day, and then we respond to it. And if too much crime is uh, growing in a particular area of the city, then we change the way we're approaching it so that we prevent crime. And police officers, police commanders, and ultimately the police commissioner and the mayor are evaluated by, are we making the city safer? Are we eliminating crime as opposed to just arresting people? Uh, that's a reinvention of government. It's very important, and I don't mean to suggest that it isn't. But the single most important reinvention that occurs in New York City for which I'm not responsible and none of my predecessors, but has more to do than anything that we do, is the reinvention that occurs by people. The reason the city of New York is so successful is that more people come there than any place else, and they reinvent the city. They change it. And uh, it really is part of the concept of what it means to be an American. It was Abraham Lincoln that uh, wrote often about the following way in which you define an American. Always a difficult thing to do. Lincoln noted that Americans are not uh, defined by race. We're not of one race. We're not defined by religion. We're of many different religions or no religion. We're not defined by ethnic uh, background. We have a number of different ethnic origins that we can look to, and they keep expanding. So what is it that makes an American? An American is defined by shared beliefs, by an understanding that you want to be in a country that provides um, as much equality as we possibly can at a given period of time and is committed to expanding that equality and a country that provides a decent and fair opportunity to people. Those are the reasons why uh, people come here. And Lincoln noted that um, if you were trying to define who's a better American, someone who's been here for three generations or someone who has just come here today but understands the notion of equality of opportunity and fairness and working hard to try to create a better future for themselves and their children, then maybe the person that's here for a day actually understands the principle of American better. Uh, that was an Abraham Lincoln who was responding to the Know Nothing movement of his day. And I wish that I could take you now, uh, when I go back uh, to New York City, if I could take you to Kennedy Airport, because I believe when I stand at Kennedy Airport, that I see in the eyes of the people that are coming in from Kennedy Airport, the same thing that used to exist in my grandfather's eyes or in Clark Welton's grandparents' eyes or maybe your parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents. Or I think that uh, however people came here, whether they came here even uh, like in, in, in freedom or in bondage or however they did, uh, there was a sense at least of an ideal that we were moving toward. Uh, we faltered. We went through uh, bad periods and good periods. but. This is uh, the only country that has been directed toward that ideal, uh, and even knowing when we fail to reach it. So I hope that that informs our debate on, uh, on immigration, because it's enormously important to it, to us. I don't see any difference between the new immigrants and the old ones uh, that existed. I think that the anti-immigration movement that's sweeping this country right now is no different than the ones that swept the country in the 1920s and in the 1840s. Uh, the Know Nothing movement that I talked about earlier encouraged Americans back in the 1840s and the 1850s uh, to close the door from, uh, for people so that no new people would come in. Even in Massachusetts, right here where we're standing, uh, that movement had a tremendous amount of vitality. In 1855, a young Irish immigrant named Mary Williams and her infant daughter Bridget were charged with the crime of poverty, and they were returned to Ireland because they were poor. 
They're thrown out of the country and sent back to Ireland. Uh, she wasn't a pauper. She wasn't a pu public charge, but she couldn't prove that she had any money. So um, she was given $12 and sent back to Ireland. And uh, with her on the boat were 35 other people who were also Irish immigrants who were sent back to Ireland because they were found guilty of the crime of poverty. A reporter for the Boston Daily Advertiser called Mary Williams a victim of know-nothing intolerance. And the know-nothings wanted to keep the strange people who uh, were Catholics uh, out of the country. And uh, Abraham Lincoln lamented the following. When the know-nothings get control, it will read, all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. If the know-nothings come to power, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty, to Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure without the base alloy of hypocrisy. <laughs> now, I don't uh, believe that uh, Lincoln was just being a romantic about immigration. I think he also understood that back then, just like now, immigration makes economic sense. Uh, the reality in New York City, which I know best, is that immigrants work harder than just about anybody else. In New York City, foreign-born males are 10% more likely to be employed than native-born males. Women, a little bit more. In New York City, immigrants own businesses in higher percentages than non-immigrants, which means they are wealth creators for other people. They provide opportunity. So when I uh, see people coming in, I see opportunities coming in. I see people who are going to, to expand what is available for themselves and for other people more often than they are going to become uh, uh, significant burdens. The fact is that immigrants are achievers, that immigrants account for 50% of all professors of engineering in the United States, 21% of all physicians in the United States, and um, they pay their own way. So if you were to take away or severely restrict immigration, you would not only affect the soul of America and the way we've defined ourselves, you'd have a much more significant impact on, uh, on the economy of this country than I think you realize. If we could take that trip to Kennedy Airport, after we were finished, I would take you to Flushing, Queens. I remember Flushing, Queens all my life. The other team in New York, the Mets play in Flushing, Queens. And uh, Flushing, Queens, about six or seven years ago, was going through a real economic downturn. Uh, stores closed, the community really going through very difficult times. If we went to Flushing, Queens tonight, you wouldn't see an empty store all being occupied. You would see a thriving restaurant businesses going on. You would see lots of new stores and you would even see light manufacturing going on and it's a net producer to the economy of the city. And all of this has happened because of immigration in the last five, six, seven years. In this particular case, immigration from Korea, from China, from India, from Vietnam, people establishing businesses and building a real future for themselves mostly accepted by the community that was there before, and in some cases, a kind of fear going on from the community that was there before, even though they are contributors. And I picked that example, uh, but I could give you lots of other examples. I could take you to Brooklyn, and I could take you to entire sections of Brooklyn, like Crown Heights, and show you what the West Indian community has done for Brooklyn. We just had a parade in Brooklyn. Three million people came to that parade because we had the West Indian Carnival. It brought like four or five million dollars into the economy of the city. Uh, there are stores, there are businesses, there are enterprises. There's a whole livery service that's been established by West Indians that wasn't there before that takes care of the problem, some of it coming from discrimination and some of it coming from just uh, the economies that uh, taxi drivers believe. It takes care of a problem of transportation that the city wasn't able to take care of before. Or we could go up to Woodlawn in the Bronx and you could see the new Irish immigration to the United States. People who have come over from Ireland in the last five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, rebuilding uh, Woodlawn in the Bronx. I probably left a group, oh yes, of course, we could go to Queens, where we have a significant immigration from all parts of South America and Latin America with new communities developing and a tremendous uh, uh, revival of uh, Queens going on, particularly in the Jackson Heights area. Uh, I can take you to almost any part of the city and I can show you the tremendous value of immigration. And it is something that is ongoing, it's going on now, and if it were cut, uh, it would really have a substantial impact on our city. 
And let me just see if I can um, uh, focus this on the national economy. And I know I, I uh, before kind of uh, destroyed my credibility as being a, uh, an objective observer of New York City. But the fact is that the city of New York is America's richest and America's most successful city. We um, contribute, according to a study that you do here at the Kennedy School, I just looked at the new one that came out, we contribute $11 billion more to Washington, D.C. than we receive back from Washington, D.C. because we have so much wealth in the city of New York, because we have a progressive income tax, and we have a disproportionate number of people that are the wealthiest people in America, we uh, contribute more to the national economy, to the national revenues, than any other place in America. $11 billion uh, deficit with the federal government. I should point out as an aside that uh, the state of Arkansas and the state of Georgia both get $1 billion more from the federal government than they send to Washington, D.C. And I want you to guess why I selected Arkansas and Georgia <laughs> as an example of that. But I made that point because uh, there's a reason for this great success, and it's because, I, I believe, because of the way this, is, uh, this city over a period of time has been renewed and has been changed uh, by people. There's no reason for this tremendous fear that we have of immigration. There's no reason for this um, tremendous uh, fear that people, more people, are going to harm us as opposed to help us. And yet, look at what Congress and the President have done just in the last uh, several months. Let me focus on legal immigration for a moment. Legal immigrants are allowed uh, to come in by the federal government. The federal government determines how many legal immigrants come into this country. And last year, it was 720,461. They're given papers, they're acknowledged, they're allowed in. When they come in, they work in large numbers, and they are taxed on an equal basis as everyone else. So when the, the 720,000 plus come in and they work, federal government extracts taxes from them on the same basis as it does from me or anyone else. Then. Since they work at higher levels, by and large, they contribute enormous amounts uh, to the federal revenues and to the federal budget. But the federal welfare bill just passed by uh, the Congress and just signed by the President would do is to say, we will let you into the United States. We will take your money on an equal basis from everyone else that's here. But if you get in trouble, we wash our hands of you. Well, you're not going to get anything unless you fit into the very narrow category of having been here for 10 years and having worked for 10 years and contributed for 10 years. And um, you're not going to get the benefits that we give to everybody else that are citizens, uh, even though we have taken money from you on an equal basis and let you into this country. I think that is a uh, terrible uh, message for America to send of basic inherent unfairness. And secondly, I question the constitutionality of it because um, you don't have to, as a matter of right, have to have benefit programs. But when you establish them, you can't invidiously discriminate against people and basically say, we'll provide it to you, but not to you. And here, this is an economic program. This is a program, the base of which is contributing to it and then receiving benefits back. And there really is no connection between the two things. This is really an attempt to try to regulate immigration in an indirect way when Congress and the President have failed to regulate it in a correct way or in a direct way. Rather than being able to properly control the number of people that come in and have uh, proper adjustments for them, what we want to say is, if you come in here and we make a mistake about you because you can't work continuously, then we want you to suffer. Because then maybe back in the country you came from, people will be less encouraged to come to the United States. This is really an absurd way to develop a country. And it is really a terrible message to send. It is totally inconsistent with the reason why America has become a great country. Uh, in essence, what we want to do is detract from the sense that people have throughout the world that this is a great place to come. And I'll, I'll explain to you how we do it with illegal immigration later because it's even more horrendous. Long term, this can change uh, what is at the core of the image of America. Unfortunately, this kind of uh, cyclical uh, view of, uh, of, of legal immigration uh, really uh, has affected us, I think, uh, rather dramatically. I believe the courts will eventually uh, decide these issues, but I really think the President and Congress should act uh, before the confusion, the anger, and the uh, difficulties get worse. Let me talk for a moment about illegal immigration, because it's more complicated 
and I think maybe the equity of it is a little harder to see. Illegal immigration is uh, wrong. It can't be defended. It shouldn't happen. People should not be allowed to come into your country without an adequate degree of responsible inspection and control. Because if you can't do that, I mean, if you can't have a responsible degree of inspection and control, then a country that can be, in essence, illegally uh, penetrated by people can also be uh, illegally penetrated with weapons, with drugs, and, uh, and maybe even with contagious diseases that it doesn't even know are happening to it. So there's a tremendous rationale for controlling the way people come into the country for all of those very valid purposes. Uh, and there's no question that America has to do a better job in the way it conducts its foreign policy, the way it reasonably controls its borders, the way it deals with deportation of controlling immigration to the United States. But then I think we have to, with some degree of wisdom, come to the following uh, perspective. We're never, ever going to be able to totally control immigration to a country that is as large as ours, that has borders that are as diverse as the borders of the United States, and that is a society that wants to be a country that values freedom, that values freedom of movement, freedom to do business. If you were to totally control immigration into the United States, if you were to totally control the flow of people in the United States, you might very well destroy the economy of the United States because you'd have to inspect everything and everyone in every way uh, possible. Uh, I don't know that there's any technological way to totally control it. There's no doubt much better ways to get more of a reasonable degree of uh, assurance about who's coming in, get more control over it. You're never totally going to control it. So we have to just accept that if we want to be the kind of country that we are. And having said that, I do believe we can do a much better job of controlling it than we've been doing. But let me tell you the practical realities that you live with in a city like New York, and on a larger scale maybe than most other places, but similar in most other places in the country, that uh, it's just going to remain despite the attempts at welfare reform and immigration reform. There are at least 400,000 people in the city of New York who are illegal and undocumented immigrants, at least 400,000, probably more. They either came in illegally, or in the case of New York City, actually, most of them probably didn't come in illegally. They probably initially came in legally, and then they overstayed, and they became what is technically known as undocumented. So we have a large number of people. Could be 400,000, it could be 450,000. The federal government deports about 1,000 people a year from New York City. So I want you to think of that number of illegal and undocumented immigrants, 400,000 or more. The number of deportations last year was like 1,400, 1,500. So uh, deportation is going to do nothing about this. For all of the tremendous debates that Congress has gone through and that the President has engaged in and the legislation that he signed, they're, they're going to increase the number of resources for deportation. That means that next year we'll deport, if they really are very efficient and do a good job, two or 3,000 people from New York City. Remember, there's a population of 400 to 450,000. So now I'm the mayor of New York City, responsible for the health, safety, and welfare of the city. I look at that legislation and I say, no matter what President Clinton does or the Congress, we're going to have 400 to 450,000 people in the city of New York that I can't do anything about who are illegal and undocumented. And the question uh, becomes, what do you do about it? since they are going to be here and the federal government is doing nothing about it and the city of New York doesn't have the capacity to do anything about it, even if it wanted to. I would do precisely what one of my predecessors did back in 1988, and that was Mayor uh, Koch, Mayor Ed Koch. That was reissued by my immediate predecessor, Mayor Dinkins, and reissued by me. He signed an executive order called Executive Order 124. That executive order protects illegal and undocumented immigrants in several respects from being reported to the Immigration and Naturalization Service. It basically says if they seek to use city services that are critical to their health and safety and critical to the health and safety of other people, then their names will not be turned into the Immigration and Naturalization Service. We will not put them in the position of having to make the Hobson's choice of having just been beaten up, let's say, do we report it to the police? And if we do, do we get turned into the Immigration and Naturalization Service? Or if they're very ill and they have 103 temperature and they don't know what to do, do we go to a hospital and seek uh, treatment for this condition that we're in 
And if we do, are we going to get turned into the Immigration and Naturalization Service? And finally, the broadest one of all, we, don't, uh, we try to have them not consider uh, that if they're going to put their child in a public school. This has created tremendous uh, controversy. From almost the day that Mayor Koch signed it to this day, there have been attempts in Congress to overturn Executive Order 124. And one of the little known things that happened in the welfare bill was that Section 434 directly reverses this executive order because Congress is so angry about it. Now, here's um, the reason why maybe if you first think about it, you say, well, this makes some sense. How can the city of New York, how can the mayor of the city of New York be telling the police department don't turn in illegal immigrants? How can you be telling teachers don't turn in illegal immigrants? How can you be telling health care workers not to do that? Here's the reason why Mayor Koch did it. Here's why it makes all the sense in the world. And here's why I think it's unconstitutional for the federal government to try to stop the city of New York from doing it. What happens to the 70 to 80,000 children who are the children of illegal and undocumented immigrants if you say to their parents, you will not be protected when you put them in public school? What happens to them? The federal government is not going to deport them. I don't believe the federal government should, but the federal government is not going to deport them. Remember 400,000 and they deport 1,000 a year? They're going to stay in New York City, except they're going to be thrown out of school. They're going to be on the streets of New York City. They're going to be hidden in the apartments of New York City. They are going to be in a condition that is horrible for them, inhumane, indecent. And one of the other reasons why I'm sure Ed Koch signed this executive order is that is going to have an enormous impact on the health and safety of everybody else that lives in the city of New York. It's going to make the city less safe. It's going to make the city more dangerous. What happens to 50, 60, 70,000 kids who are too afraid to go to school or whose parents put them out of school, but have an impact on the health and safety of others? Secondly, what happens to a city in which you have four to 400,000 people, 450,000 people, who let's say in equal proportion to everybody else are the victims of crime? And now they don't report the crimes that were committed against them to the police. That's a horrible thing to do to them. It drives them further and further into the underground. But it's a horrible thing to do for everybody else because muggers don't, like, check for green cards. <laughs> uh, Congress may think that, but they don't. Like, they don't, they don't run up to somebody and say, are you a citizen? Are you legal or illegal? And then the person says, I'm a citizen. Well, they're not going to touch you. And the president says, well, I'm a legal immigrant. I'm not going to touch you. I'm illegal. And then that person gets mugged. The fact is that when you deprive yourself of the information that you could get from the people who are illegal, who are the victims of crime, in a city that has 400 to 450,000 people who are, you put the health and the safety of other people at risk. The police department of New York City relies to a significant degree on the information that we obtain from people who are illegal and undocumented to protect the lives and the safety of people who are citizens and people who are legal because you can't kind of divide it up that way. And that was also part of the wisdom that was at the core of what May Mayor Koch did in Executive Order 124. Finally, I don't think I have to draw it out anymore to deal with the health and diseases. A person is ill, a person is sick, the person is illegal or undocumented. It is much better I think for a society to say, we will let you access health services without putting you in the position of having to worry about, for that reason, being thrown out of the country or put on a long list of people that's going to be harassed and thrown out of the country. But if you can't accept that as a basis, people can disagree about that. How about the fact that one of these people easily could have a contagious disease? We have diseases in New York City, like in the rest of the country, that are contagious. We need to know about that. Public health is largely concerned with having to deal with that. That's the way in which we discover things that are going to affect the health, the safety of other people. So when Mayor Koch signed that executive order, it was exercising a power that's called uh, the police power. The police power uh, in America, going back to the framers of the Constitution, is more broadly defined than just arresting people or dealing with crime. It's the power that a local government and a state government has to provide for the health and safety of, uh, of the community. Now, why is this a constitutional issue? The other night when I listened to the presidential debate, I didn't hear any mention about immigration, but there were two things that woke me up, and I'm very provincial. The first one was when Senator Dole commended us for the great crime reduction in New York City. I have to say, I woke up when I heard that. 
But the second one was, toward the end of the debate, when Senator Dole said something that I bet most people didn't pay any attention to, he said, I carry the Tenth Amendment around in my pocket. Well, let me tell you what the Tenth Amendment says. I said, I have it in my pocket. <laughs> uh, the Tenth Amendment says that the powers not granted to the federal government are reserved to the states and the people thereof. What that means is, and this is something I've heard Senator Dole say often, and I've heard President Clinton say this often, the best government is the government closest to the people. The government that makes the most relevant and best decisions about the lives and safety of people is the government closest to the people. The government that is the most responsive to the real concerns that people have is the government closest to the people. I've heard that from both presidential candidates often, both rhetorically and personally. What Ed Koch did was make a decision that was the decision made by the government closest to the people. He exercised the police power to protect all of the people of the city. Section 434 of the Welfare Reform Bill overrides that decision and basically says the federal government knows better. You as the mayor of New York City really don't know how to protect the health, safety of uh, the people of your city. We, the large, gigantic federal government, in our wisdom in exercising our power to control immigration, really know better than you how to provide for the health and safety of the city of New York. And therefore, you're reversed, you can't do that, and you go tell all your employees they better not protect people who are illegal and undocumented. This puts in conflict two um, provisions of the Constitution. One is exercise of the police power under the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, which is exactly what Ed Koch did, and the other is the power of the federal government to control immigration. But I really question whether this is an attempt to control immigration. Here's how you control immigration. You do it by setting uh, quotas. You do it by a border patrol. You do it by having relations with foreign governments that encourage or discourage or try to channel immigration. You do it by when people are illegal and undocumented, deporting them, but not a thousand a year in a city that has 400,000. That's just, that isn't even a token attempt to try to deal with it. So now the federal government, instead of doing all of those other things that would be a direct way of regulating immigration, what the federal government wants to say is, we're going to discourage you from coming here by treating you miserably when you, when you get here, by treating you inhumanely when you get here, by putting you in a position where your children will have to be out on the streets. If you get sick, you can't get help. And if you are a woman, Living in a home with a, with a man, because domestic violence is an area of great concern for us that we're trying to do more about, and he's beating you, you can't report that to the police, because if you do, you'll be sent out of the country, uh, which is only one of a number of examples of the horrible things that happen to people. And I believe that in that choice, uh, the court will select the Tenth Amendment, because I don't believe that the United States Congress and the President are validly exercising the power to control immigration. And I believe the mayor of New York City in Ed Koch was validly exercising, completely and in good faith, the power to try to provide for the health and safety of the entire uh, community. So we will tomorrow file a lawsuit in the Southern District of New York. This is the only thing I really know how to do is sue. <laughs> it's all those years. It's all those years of being a lawyer and um, to try and have that portion of um, to try and have the, that portion of the welfare bill declared unconstitutional. We also will eventually file a, a lawsuit that challenges those provisions of the bill that treat legal immigrants unfairly, that treat them in a discriminatory way, and that in a um, fundamental way just seem to me to be um, just unfair. I mean, America, I mean, if you, if you sort of boil down all the notions about America, it really comes down to a country that keeps attempting to be fair with people. It fails. It has this great objective of fairness. It fails at it, then it tries to improve itself, fails at it some more, improves itself some more. But all through that, we have a form of, uh, of progress. It is just essentially unfair to me to say to people, come in here, we'll take your money on an equal basis. But then if you get in trouble, you will not be treated equal. You will be treated discriminatorily. Somehow, somewhere in the Constitution of the United States, I think I can find reasons why that shouldn't be done. If I can't find it in the Constitution of the United States, I can find it like just in the basic fairness that people should have uh, for each other. And something we keep moving toward, hopefully, is fairness. 
Also, very, very important to changing the way this reaction takes place is for more people to talk about the positive aspects of immigration, which in my view uh, far outweigh the negative parts of it. The sole concentration of the discussion has been on the negative parts of it. And let me tell you one area in which the federal government and the city of New York and cities throughout America could usefully cooperate. And it really would help to promote public safety and public health. Right now in uh, the city of New York, there are 2,500 people sitting in jail in New York City who are arrested, who are illegal and undocumented for committing serious crimes, which range anywhere from selling drugs to killing somebody. Right now there are about 3,000 people sitting in state prisons in New York who are convicted of felonies and serving fairly long prison sentences who are illegal and undocumented. Last year of that group of people, which amounts to definably anywhere from seven to about 9,000 per year, all of whom are sent to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, these are the names we, we send them, they deported 330 people. Now, my offer to the federal government is, help me get rid of these people. Then we can start worrying about people who put their children in school, people who are sick who go into the hospital, and people who are the victims of crime and just want to report it. But it makes no sense to me at all to be ignoring people who are aggressive, antisocial people who are harming people in their own community and in the rest of the city, and then trying to put your concentration on people who may be here in an illegal status, but are actually taking steps that are positive steps, like putting their children in school, or seeking to report a crime to help us, or seeking to get treatment for themselves. And I think that would be a much more effective collaboration that would uh, achieve the interests of most of the cities and states in this country and the federal government. Uh, we're also announcing uh, tomorrow that there will be a coalition of individuals formed uh, who can try to get out this message, a uh, positive message about immigration and help people on the road to becoming citizens uh, uh, faster. And uh, it really is important uh, to do that because if you talk about immigration in more than a soundbite, if you spend some time reflecting on it, then some of, uh, some of the anger and some of the uh, fears uh, can easily be overcome. So I thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm very, very happy to answer any questions you have about that or baseball. Many of you know the rules of the forum. Uh, we have four mics, I think, spread around. I can't really see those up above, but we'll try to uh, do the rounds anyway. We'll start here and we'll go around this way. Uh, please make sure that your questions are really questions and not speeches, and try to keep them brief because uh, Mayor Giuliani has to leave in about 15 minutes to catch a plane back to New York. So we don't have time for a lot of Q&A, but uh, if we make them brief, we can have quite a few. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Gi Giuliani. Um, I think I'm not alone in this audience in saying that I appreciate the national leadership you've taken on the uh, welfare reform law and its effect on uh, immigrants. And I think it's especially good that you've taken this message out on the road to audiences outside of New York City. Um, you mentioned in your speech, however, the mayor, uh, uh, an old mayor of Boston, the current mayor of Boston, Thomas Menino, visited New York City last year and was invited to speak at a senior citizen center at a public housing project. Um, he, his subject that he was going to speak on was the Republican contract with America and its effect on senior citizens. Your administration barred him from speaking at this event and you told the New York Times that uh, his speaking would have been a partisan political event. Um, my question for you is twofold. First, how do you explain that apparent contradiction um, and second, with hindsight and your travels to other cities in the last few weeks, um, would you reconsider that policy in New York? No, two things have no connection with, it, with each other. The Housing Authority has a long-standing rule that they do not allow partisan political events at Housing Authority uh, developments. I was excluded on at least 10 occasions from doing that when there was a Democratic administration in New York City. And at you different were campaigning times, for mayor at the time, though, weren't you? Uh, no, at various times I was supporting candidates 
for uh, different positions in New York City. That was a rule that was very strictly enforced by the then Democratic administration. And I enforce that rule against uh, mayors who are Democrats that seek to do it, candidates of the Republican Party who seek to do it. Uh, we do not allow partisan political events at the Housing Authority. And that, and maybe the mayor of Boston didn't realize that what he, that's what he was walking into, but the head of the Housing Authority did. We do it across the board. We do it for the Republicans. We do it for Democrats. We do it for liberals, conservatives. And uh, that just happens to be a rule that we neutrally enforce. So no, I wouldn't do it any differently. I would do it exactly the same. And actually, I didn't do it. The Housing Authority did. I agreed with it. Thank you. Good. Well, I'm told that we have a few extra minutes. I'm told that you have to late 25. So we have a few more minutes than we thought we did. Yes. Hi, my name is Lori Pune. Um, you talked about reinventing and restructuring government. Um, and I think right now it's pretty apparent that the Child Welfare Administration of New York City is having many problems dealing with the maybe it's a larger amount now or we're becoming more aware of the fact that people are not fulfilling their jobs in terms of determining neglect um, and I'd like to know how you plan on fixing that system. Sure, the first thing the first thing that we did was to take the Child Welfare Administration out from under the Human Resources Administration. We had the Child Welfare Administration buried in an agency that uh, spends about 6.5 billion dollars that has other purposes, mostly administering welfare cases, other social services. So I separated it, made it a separate agency, the Administration for Children's Services. I uh, hired an, a person to run it who has a very significant background as a deputy mayor, as a commissioner of investigation, and a person who has uh, himself been a foster child and helped to develop probably the premier foster agency in the city of New York. Uh, and what he is trying to do are the things that you would have to do to really make uh, social services, particularly for children at risk, worse, work better. The first and most fundamental is to change the philosophy of the former Child Welfare Administration, now the ACS. And by that I mean what had happened over a period of time is the philosophy had become reunification of families and keeping families together. I shouldn't say at any cost, but it almost had gotten to that extreme. And what uh, Nick Scapetta, who is the person who does this job and the people that he's brought in have to do, is to refocus the philosophy, like we've refocused the philosophy in the police department. The philosophy in the police department of putting emphasis on arrests didn't accomplish the ultimate goal of preventing crime. The philosophy of reunification of families, when you emphasize it too much, means you miss a lot of cases in which you should put the protection of the child first. So he is, through much more significant training, for the first time uh, in the last year, year and a half, people who took tests to become social workers to deal with uh, children that were at risk actually were failed. The city had never done that before. I mean, just on a bell curve, a few people have to fail. Uh, Nick has introduced much higher standards. He's increased the training. Uh, he is now reorganizing an entirely different supervisory system so that there are clear lines of responsibility. Uh, he is trying to reverse 20, 25 years of serious problems. Uh, and then at the core of it, there are also inherent social and family problems that no administration uh, can really uh, totally handle. He's, he's in an area of enormous complexity and I think doing a terrific job. And he is looking at a uh, model for trying to involve uh, community services to see if we can do a better job of working with community organizations to get the help that we need. And finally, uh, we're making a tremendous effort to try to restructure child welfare in New York City. We spend $1.3 billion on it. We don't spend it wisely enough. We're trying to restructure it. We're setting much higher standards and much higher selection criteria, and we have an exceptional commissioner. Finally, we have to note in the right spirit that this is not all about government, that we need more significant involvement of people. We had a child die a short while ago and um, the Child Welfare Administration, because most of the contacts were with the former administration, you probably can find a lot of things wrong with the way in which it was documented, the way in which it was looked at, the way, way, way in which it was dealt with. But you could find even more wrong with the uh, people in the community not reporting it, not following up when they reported it, with uh, the, the family members not reporting it, with the father who was absent saying, well, he didn't really know what was going on, you, you need to also challenge the community and the family groups that are, are around children to take more responsibility. Because even if we 
have the most successful reinvention of the ACS, the Administration for Children's Service. Even if we have more success with that than we've had with the police department, which has been tremendous, we're not going to be able to do this job if we don't have uh, lots of people taking responsibility for children uh, right in the community. Uh, there's a big gap there also that has to be focused on. Thank you. Are you waiting to speak? Yeah. Would you please identify yourself? Okay. Hi, my name is Kevin Daly. Um, first of all, my father wanted to ask me, uh, ask you rather, uh, whether you're going to the Bishop Lachlan reunion later this month. <laughs> <laughs> That's the high school that I went to, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to. Okay. I even remember the school song, but I won't sing it. <laughs> Um, secondly, I have one observation. Uh, I agree with your stance on immigration. I myself am a second generation American. And my observation is that I think many immigrants understand the true spirit of what America is better than many native born Americans. Uh, I can't count the number of times that my grandfather told me that America was the greatest country in, country in the world and to really appreciate that fact. Um, my question though is um, you are a very interesting mayor in that you've taken many uh, cross-party stances and uh, you know, you've been your own person in, in the position of mayor of New York. But in doing so, in taking a, a cross-party stance on, uh, say, the governor, uh, choice for the governor of New York, um, don't you feel that you've somewhat alienated your voter base and uh, somewhat alienated your ability, well, sem separated yourself from an ability to work in a political administration in, in New York City? <laughs> Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, it, it, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, how to be the mayor of New York City. And uh, this is, New York City is its own very unique uh, place. It's not even a city. It's, a, it's really a, a confederation of five counties. Uh, it's a very unique government structure. It's a very unique place. And the most successful mayors of New York City have been unpredictable. It's really true. Uh, Fiorello LaGuardia was a Republican like I am, and Fiorello LaGuardia rarely, but on occasion, supported Democratic candidates. In, uh, th out of, in the three presidential races while he was the mayor of New York City, he once supported a Democrat, he twice supported Republicans. Mostly he supported Republican candidates, occasionally he would support a Democratic candidate for Congress. Ed Koch, who I regard as a successful mayor of New York City, more successful than probably anybody in between uh, Mayor LaGuardia and, and right now. Very similarly, <laughs> this is what gets me in trouble with him. Um, he was a Democrat, largely supported Democrats for president, for governor, for Congress, for Senate. Every once in a while, Ed Koch would support a Republican when he thought a Republican would do a better job for the city. Or I shouldn't say when they would do a better job, when there was a tremendous material difference between the two people when there was a lot uh, hanging in the balance, where maybe his endorsement could make a big difference or the city would be really helped by it. If you put yourself into a very partisan uh, position as the mayor of New York City, and some of my predecessors have done that, put themselves in a very partisan position, you miss uh, the reality of having to work with both political parties, uh, having to have things you can trade with both of them, things that they're going to need from you so that you can help the city. And finally, I think you miss uh, what is really the true spirit of New York. So I don't think it hurts with New Yorkers. New Yorkers are basically independent people. New Yorkers, although they're largely Democrats, some Republicans, et cetera, most New Yorkers probably agree with me that blind affiliation to a political party really, um, you kind of lose your intelligence when you do that, your ability to think, because neither political party uh, has all the answers. And in my view, both of them are wrong and right about an equal amount of time. When you, stop, when you stop really believing that, you've sort of surrendered your intellect to, I don't know what, but some kind of emotional response to the problems that exist in the world. Hi there. I'm John MacArthur, and I'm from Canada, actually. And it's interesting to hear you talk about immigration, because it's been uh, immigration policy in Canada has had a su substantial review in the past five years. And actually, uh, there's been a move away from family reunification and a move towards uh, potential investors and people who have substantial resources to bring to the country. So my first question is just what you think about actual criteria yeah. for. It's a long, it's a long waiting. Oh, but my second one is just wondering if he's decided who he'll endorse for president. <laughs> yet, so. Does it sound like I have? No, I haven't decided who I'm going to endorse for president. Yesterday I endorsed Bernie Williams, but 
That's because he won the game for the Yankees. Uh, but I could change my mind, you know, tomorrow or the next day. Uh, I think family reunification is a good criteria, and I think it served America uh, really well. And uh, investment in the country, uh, people who have unique skills, uh, unique abilities, unique things that we need at a particular time, has always been part of uh, the immigration criteria, and it's important. But by and large, family reunification, I think, is important. And I think, um, uh, frankly, America needs that now. America needs an emphasis on family reunification, families being important. Families are going to have more to do with how America is 30 years from now than anything I do as the mayor of New York City or anything uh, whoever the next president of the United States does. At least that's my view. And uh, it's, it's an it's a institution in our society that has deteriorated, and anything that we can do to rebuild it is a good thing to do. This gentleman over here. Yeah, hi. I'm Richard Sobel. I'm a fellow uh, this year. Uh, I want to commend you for talking so forcefully about immigration. Uh, it's a tremendously important subject. I've talked about it and faced a lot of hostility, and I think the more people who talk about it, the, the better. I was also particularly intrigued about your use of constitutional arguments about this, mixed with the benefits to society and the detriments of mistreating so-called illegal immigration, health benefits, educational benefits, crime benefits. I'm curious what your thoughts are about the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which was really the first attempt to start separating out citizens and non-citizens through some identification process, particularly in terms of, though this is aimed at illegal immigrants, much of the effect is on citizens. And it has been a totally ineffective law in terms of any reduction in illegal immigration. But the, the premise of the law is that everyone is an illegal immigrant until otherwise proven. Uh, which I would see as contradictory to the 14th Amendment, citizenship is by birth and naturalization. See, I remember, I remember the Immigration Reform Act of, of uh, 1986 when it first started as the Simpson-Mazzoli bill back in the early 1980s. And there was a portion of it that I agreed with. And, the, uh, and then uh, time really made that less effective. Uh, what the Simpson-Mazzoli bill did was to give amnesty to people that were, that were here in the United States. It actually gave amnesty to people that were illegal and undocumented. And it gave amnesty to people that were there as of a date, probably what originally would have been within a few months of the passage of the law. And then when the law got extended, the date for amnesty didn't. And the date for amnesty was like four years before the passage of the law. It became like a, a, an abstract uh, notion. I think that would have been a good concept. I think the idea of having uh, sanctions on in employers, I don't really know how that's working. Uh, I don't think it has much of an impact on immigration. I think that all of these things are almost an avoidance of really dealing with immigration. Uh, the fact is that uh, people come into this country for much more basic fundamental reasons than whether there are going to be employer sanctions or not. Uh, they're not going to focus when they're coming into this country as to whether their children are going to be in school or not, or at least large numbers of them aren't. So, we're dealing at the margins with it without dealing with the core parts of it. But I honestly can't tell you what, how the bill has worked itself out because I haven't really paid attention to it. But I will. I'll take it, a look. It hasn't worked. I'm told we only have time for one more question. Oh, You're thank in. you. <laughs> My name is Avery Gardner, and I'm a senior at Harvard College. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the family preferences system. When Senator Simpson was here last spring, he talked about how he wanted to reform the family preferences system so that it first reunified nuclear families, and then after we took care of all of the nuclear families on the waiting list, to then focus on the extended family networks. He was criticized by a lot of people by saying that that was forcing people to conform to what we, as Americans, view as an important conception of the family. How would you respond? I think we have to have a flexible definition of family because people's definition, pe people's definition of family is, is different. And one of the things that you have to try to do um, when you legislate in America is to, um, is to make it broad enough to encompass other people's definitions of what, of what you think is the only way in which uh, something should exist. So I would, I would favor, I, I really don't think there are terrible problems with the criteria that presently exist or have existed for family reunification. I don't think uh, immigration over the last 30 to 40 years has been a terrible problem for America 
as I guess I tried to point out, I think immigration has, has uh, worked pretty well. I think it has areas of problems. I think the federal government isn't doing enough about illegal immigration, focusing on the right people, the people who are committing crimes. Uh, but by and large, I don't think the immigration system needs a tremendous reform. And finally, I don't subscribe to the sort of uh, macro notion that America is too crowded, that we have too many people, that there aren't enough jobs. Uh, I don't think America has, has enough people. I think the challenge of new people will create more jobs. I think it will create more opportunity. I think uh, you have people, and before when, when we were talking at dinner, there was the notion that we should have criteria, maybe like the investment criteria, or by and large we should focus on the amount of resources somebody has, or I think it's been very good for America that we've let a lot of poor people come into America. I think that we want to continue to allow a lot of poor people to come into America because when they, uh, when they do, they really ignite things that maybe a lot of rich people can't do. They have a tremendous desire for success. They have a tremendous desire to kind of push themselves and their family up the economic ladder. They put a tremendous amount of emphasis on making uh, their children understand the value of learning in school and being disciplined in school in order to learn, in order to be successful. These are things that we need to remind ourselves of. And you forget them when you become more comfortable. Not everybody, but some people forget them when they become more comfortable. And that is part of the human competition that has been a unique thing about the United States. When I think about Boston, I think about all that tremendous immigration in the, you know, in the, 19th, in the, in the 20th century. Of, and the 19th and 20th century, basically of very, very poor people. The people selected weren't the, the uh, few wealthy or educated people in Ireland or Italy or Greece. or They were the poorest people who had to leave because they didn't have any food. And when they came here, they came here with this tremendous, unbelievable desire to succeed. Not all of them did, but they created a spirit that is tremendous. That same thing now goes on in, uh, in, in Africa, it goes on in South America, it goes on in Asia, it continues to go on in Europe. And of course we need people who can do specific things, who have great talents, who have a lot of money, and it's terrific to have more people invest. But if you ask me to make a choice, I would rather see us, and I know this is going to be totally misunderstood, but I would rather see us have uh, a lot of poor people come into this country knowing why they're coming here. Thank you.